Good morning and welcome to this third workshop <clears throat> in the context of our um, Kaneri Expert Committee Impact of the COVID pandemic on scientists, scientific practice and trust in science. I'm Natalie Helberger, Distinguished University Professor of Law and um, AI at the University and Chair of this committee. And together with me, uh, there's a formidable number of colleagues here from the Canavé in this committee. And we were tasked by the Canavé to take stock of the positive and negative effects of the COVID pandemic on scientists, scientific practices, and trust in science, with special attention to young academics, and also the long-term consequences of the pandemic of for science and science understood in a very broad way, also including um, all areas of academic research. And then an um, important task for this committee is to also look into the future and make, re make recommendations for retaining positive consequences or mo momentum for positive change, as well as ways of mitigating or remedying um, the, the many negative consequences. And in our two last expert sessions, we had engaged conversations about the pandemic and trust in science, as well as the impact on researchers and young researchers in particular. And we were already able to formulate a number of forward-looking conclusions and recommendations. For those of you who have missed the last two meetings, you can soon watch them back online. Um, and today we will look into the third topic that will feature prominently in our report, Academics on Fire, uh, and on the difficult balance of research taking the time it needs and the requirements for speedy insights and scientists being in the middle of topical debates that require answers now and not after months or even years of review. Um, and for information on the final workshop, uh, please um, visit um, the, the website and maybe Eva, you could put the link in the chat. Talking about the chat, um, this is a debate that concerns all of us and your opinion, your experiences and suggestions matter greatly for us and for this report. So please use the Q&A function and the chat function and ask questions or post a comment or a suggestion. And if you have questions for a specific speaker, please start with the name of the speaker. We will monitor the chat and do our best to address as many questions that you have during the meeting as possible. And all the input that you provide will be kept and used for the advisor trajectory. And I have now the great pleasure to introduce today's moderators who will then introduce our distinguished speakers. Professor Lex Bauter, Professor of Methodology and Integrity at the Amsterdam UMC, FU Medical Center, and Karlein Bauten, Professor of Biomechanical Engineering at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Lex and Karlein, I hand over to you. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. Um, good morning to all of you. Um, and, and my task is, as I said before, um, to chair the first half of this meeting. That's an honor and a privilege, of course. Um, although my main task is timekeeping. Uh, I'm trying to be kind and strict, uh, which is a difficult combination, of course. Um, as I said before, we had uh, an interesting topic, topic today. What does time pressure to us, to, to scientists, to researchers, to science? Um, and what does it do to the process and the quality of our research? Um, we have invited four experts uh, to react on this topic from four different angles. And after each presentation, there will be a, a Q&A, a short Q&A, but a, a nice Q&A. Um, and as Natalie said before, please pose your questions as briefly and clearly as you can in the Q&A function. The Q&A function is for questions. Um, and as I said before, we are really interested in what more you have to offer us as a committee to write a good report. And all these other stuff, these can be references, opinions, uh, debates you have among yourself during the session, do that in the chat, please. And, and that enable us to, to be clear what the questions are. Uh, and the same rhythm will be there in the final plenary discussion. Um, it has already been said, I believe, we are recording this meeting um, and it will be made available on the Kaname YouTube channel later on. Uh, so you can look back what we had today. 
And now it's a preference for me to introduce uh, Marcel Levy. Um, well, he doesn't need that much of an introduction, of course, uh, uh, but I'll still do it. Um, Marcel was the chair of the one of the two university medical centers in Amsterdam uh, just before the merge. Um, then he moved on to London and there he was chairing the University College um, of London hospitals. And now he's back in our country and sharing NWO. Um, and you will, without doubt, has noted that he has opinions on COVID and, and also on many other topics. And we really look forward to his views, Marcel's views on the lessons learned during this pandemic uh, still going on, on how we, the medical sciences specifically, but also the other sciences function in times of crisis. So without further ado, Marcel, the floor is yours. Please share your screen. Thanks, Lex. Um, I um, cannot show my video actually because somebody has stopped it. So maybe somebody can do it, but I hope I can share my screen in the meantime. All right. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for the kind introduction, Lex. I've been asked to share some thoughts on medical science in times of crisis and the lessons we may have learned as a kind of an introduction to this very nice symposium. Um, it is very hard to believe that it was only uh, two years ago that we were first confronted with uh, this virus. And actually, if you look at it, it is extremely small, like most viruses. It's also very simple. It has only 15 genes, and in comparison, humans have 30,000 genes. Uh, but still, it was able to completely put the world upside down um, in the last two years, indeed. And you may remember this picture from China um, that was taken in January 2020. So that's almost two years ago. And at that point in time, it all was a bit strange. It sounded like a problem that was very far away from us. Um, and people were not sure whether we would be affected at all by what was happening in Huang at the time. But of course, uh, things um, were different then, uh, because very soon after that, also European hospitals, first in Italy and Spain and later on everywhere, were affected by very large numbers of very sick people. Um, and that resulted in, of course, a lot of questions, panic and uh, uh, the quest for solutions. And what I would like to draw your attention to is that it was only two weeks after the first report of sick people in Huang that one of the leading medical journals already published a paper coming from China, from Huang, describing quite a lot in detail this disease that occurred in China. So that was very quickly. And not only could they describe what was happening to the patients, but they also isolated and presented pictures of that virus. So this was two weeks after the first occurrence of the, at that time, epidemic, later on pandemic. And it just took another three weeks before the complete genome of the virus was published in one of the other leading um, international journals, again, from a group from, from uh, China. And this, of course, was the template for further research, for example, developing the PCR test that's now being done a million times every week. Um, and also, of course, the template for the development of the vaccines that were later on developed. And it took only a few months before these vaccines were indeed available and could be tested in humans. And here you see, for example, results of the two RNA vaccines uh, and the impressive effect they had on um, um, uh, um, uh, clinical endpoints in, in, in those who were vaccinated in comparison to control subjects. And even last week, we saw another paper actually responding to the effect of vaccine boosters that are now being widely distributed in the, uh, in the world uh, and their effect on mortality. And it's quite impressive to see that indeed this third booster um, uh, does have this effect and may even protect about, uh, against the most infectious viruses that we now all know. So why am I telling this? Well, this is just an interesting timetable because you see the breathtaking speed that science responded to a very big problem in the world. 
And it took less than a year to actually coming from the first patient who was identified in China to having effective vaccines available. And of course, the story has not ended, certainly not on a world scale, uh, but also not on, on, on a Western country scale. But th I think we have made a lot of progress and science has responded, I think, uh, splendidly um, in, in coming to solutions when we really needed them. If you take a step back and you look at other pandemics and epidemics that, that actually affected the world, there are many examples. This is, for example, uh, a picture of an Egyptian mummy long before uh, um, the starting of the, um, uh, uh, of the way we count our years, um, death due to tuberculosis. And tuberculosis has been with us for ages and has affected more than 2.5 billion people worldwide. And as you can see, Tuberculosis is not completely solved, but it is actually vanished from most parts of the world and is still decreasing. But it took a very, very long time to get there. A little bit later on, in the 14th century, Europe and uh, parts of Asia were actually affected by the plague, uh, which is caused by a bacteria, Virginia pestis. 100 million people were dead. And it took about four centuries to be completely exterminated in the Western world. And another plague more recently, of course, was HIV that affected patients in the early 80s of the previous century, also with initially excessive mortality and morbidity, and actually has now become a chronic illness for most people in the world. And we are very close to finding a cure for patients with HIV. So if you put this all in a, in a graph, you can actually see that the way science is able to respond to these major pandemics, to these major disasters that could affect humans, has become exponentially short. And the half-life of pandemics have become very, very short. And I think this can be seen or can be celebrated as a success of science. So I think it is fair to say that the solution to many many societal problems will come from research and innovation. And you may even argue that all societal problems could benefit from research and innovation. And I think this is a fantastic example. And it's quite interesting to see that when the European population was asked only a month ago how they feel about science, 88% 80, of them was extremely positive about science and 92% of them thought that science was able to improve their individual lives. And this, this trust in science has never been as big as it was, and I think rightfully, um, in the last few years. But of course, it's always good to look back and to see what was really good and what was really not good. And here I made a graph of the number of medical or biomedical publications on COVID-19, which was, of course, close to zero in January 20, but has now grown to almost 200,000. So in less than two years, 200,000 publications uh, were actually published on COVID-19 in the biomedical sciences. This is coming mostly from, from PubMed. Well, is this good news or not? Well, let's take a little bit a closer look at the type of publications that people were actually publishing on this subject. And of course, what we really need if we want to improve diagnosis and treatment of patients with COVID-19 is randomized controlled trials, which you can see on the green slice here that this is just a tiny part, <coughs> excuse me, of these 200,000 publications. Since the absolute number is so big, I'm not complaining. We still have plenty very, very useful randomized controlled trials. So that's not a problem. And I think the scientific community has responded expertly and very rapidly um, and came up with important, question, important answers to questions that were raised by clinicians. So, uh, it's very nice to have randomized controlled trials and sometimes also retrospective cohort studies, also quite substantial part of this pie, um, are, could be very helpful. But I'm slightly less certain about the enormous number of case series, case reports, uncontrolled studies, reviews, and all kinds of all other publications that were published, and which actually, to be honest, form the majority of the publications. So you may even argue that there is quite a lot of pollution in the medical literature of studies and reports that are not really helpful, but can actually be a big distraction from clinicians looking for answers. 
This is another interesting slide looking at the publications on uh, uh, COVID-19, and this is only covering 2020, so the beginning. Um, and what was really happening at the same time was that not only the number of publications exploded, but also the use of preprint servers by biomedical sciences. And I think this is a two-edged sword. In the first, on the, on the one hand, this means that results from research fair very rapidly available to a very wide community. But of course, the downside is that publication on a preprint server does not mean the results and the study has been reviewed by experts. So the quality of everything that's been published on preprint servers is uncertain. And, and I didn't put the slide in, but actually there's quite a lot of evidence that the majority of stuff that was put on preprint servers has not been published um, uh, after peer review. So you may argue that there was also a lot of noise in the system. A good thing, on the other hand, is of course the availability of all that scientific knowledge, because a lot of the major publishing companies decided very early on in the pandemic that everything should be available through open access, free for everyone who wanted to read it, regardless of whether you had a subscription or not uh, on the journal. And actually, the number of publications on COVID-19 that were accessible through free access is about 80%, and that's substantially higher than comparable numbers of publications in the field of diabetes, or slightly less so in dementia. So this was, I think, a good thing, and we have now all tasted how important it is to have open access and to have freely accessible literature in times of need. And maybe we should have this all the time. And lastly, it was interesting to see that the traditional big research countries sometimes were doing uh, a lot of work on um, uh, uh, COVID-19, but there were also other countries that actually had a larger part than their usual fair share. For example, Italy and the UK, where of course there was a lot of burden on COVID-19, but also China um, uh, uh, put a large footprint on the number of publications. Uh, dealing with COVID-19. So that's actually interesting to see that this in a very short period of time could completely change. A few words on COVID-19 vaccine, because I think what happened there was another illustration on how quickly the world could respond. And I'll tell you a little bit of, uh, um, of, of background first. This is participation in COVID-19 vaccination trials in, the Western, in Western Europe. And as we're speaking now in the Netherlands, um, it is actually interesting to see that the Netherlands hardly participated in any of the vaccination trials in Western Europe, which is surprising because usually the Netherlands plays a relatively large contribution in clinical trials. But because of very uh, peculiar and very particular regulations in the Netherlands, it was not easy to introduce the specific vaccines with their vectors or mRNA technology into the clinical trial arena in the Netherlands initially. And this led to a situation that um, not a lot of Dutch researchers and hospitals could participate in the trials. I think that was not a good thing because that may actually um, have resulted in the fact that the Netherlands was about the last country that started vaccination in Western Europe. And I think if you participate in research and you see something coming, you're better prepared for what's coming next, implementation and execution of, in this case, an important treatment or preventive treatment. Um, so again, this may have learned us that participation in research also improves care and cure. But I think it is a nice illustration that science works. And for the last few minutes of my talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a personal story where things went differently than what we have seen before. I was working in London at the time, as Lex already introduced, and I was also clinically active. And one of my patients was a 30-year-old nurse with not a specific medical history. The only thing was that she had been vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine two weeks before she came. And when she came, she had headache and some neurological signs and symptoms. And we saw of a thrombosis in the brain. So we made a CT venogram. You can see the picture here. And I'm, 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 I'm sure not every one of you is familiar with the picture. But just to give you an impression, what you could see on that picture was that there was indeed a thrombosis in the venous uh, system of the brain, which is actually a quite rare condition. 
But this presentation was a bit strange because she also had a very low platelet count and very rapidly, despite anticoagulation, she, dis she developed much more rare thrombosis in different parts of the body. And when I presented the case, to my colleagues, they said they had seen two similar cases in the month before, also not very long after AstraZeneca. And then we actually collected information in the country and it turned out that there were 20 people in the UK who actually had similar symptoms. So, and to make a long story short, and you can read this all back in, in, in the uh, medical literature, but also in the popular literature, uh, I was working with Mary Scully at the time, a brilliant hematologist, and she was leader of our group. And she actually could link all these rare blood clotting diseases to the AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccination. And not only that, we were able to very quickly identify the underlying mechanism, which was important for a better treatment of these patients and identification of the right cases. And I thought at the time that the information was so important that we could not wait until publishing this. So I decided to send an email to about 700 people that were in my um, uh, uh, email box uh, and in my address list who were active in this field and who may have con been confronted with the same situation. And this started a kind of an avalanche of emails throughout the world. So within a period of two or three days, the entire hematology and hemostasis community knew about this um, a side effect, knew about the underlying mechanisms and knew how to treat these patients. And of course, this was followed, of course, by a scientific report that was then published 10 days later, fully peer reviewed in the New England Journal of Medicine. So indeed, you can make a lot of speed in science if there is a real big clinical need. And that was another very important learning point that may be relevant also for the future and other situations. What so asked. In conclusion, um, I think it's fair to say that research really works when there is a big problem and um, uh, that we, of course, can rely on research to solve societal problems. But of course, we may learn a little bit about how this can work out better in future uh, 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 pandemics and other emergency situations. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Marcel. Um, this was really an interesting story about the, the good contributions of science to the fight of the pandemic and, and also uh, to discovering and solving the issue of side effects of, of one of the vaccines. Um, you've run a little bit over time, so there is not there's quite time for one question, and, and the audience uh, is getting awake slowly on Monday morning as well. There aren't that many questions. Um, one question for you, Marcel, is um, you're now in a different position. You're now um, head of a big funding agency in the Netherlands. Um, what can funding agency, what they do, did they do it well and what can they do better in the future? And, and, yeah. and just a brief answer, just an uh, impression I'm asking. For. Yeah, a big, a, a very uh, a quick impression. Um, I think the Netherlands did well in terms of making funds available to do research on, on COVID. And this went really quickly. Um, and I think initially the focus may have been a little bit too much on biomedical aspects of COVID-19 which is in the beginning understandable, but we very soon found out that there were many other um, areas of science that could be helpful here. Think about, you know, behavioral sciences, uh, economics, um, uh, soci sociology, economists. Uh, and I was quite it was quite fortunate that the program was able to shift its attention, not totally away from biomedical things, but also was able to support a lot of research that was crucial for the societal response to COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, well, th thank you very much. And thank you very much for your fascinating and, and constructive, positive lecture. It's a great opening for this meeting. Um, I'd now like to move on to our second speaker, and that is uh, Cecile Janssens. Cecile is Dutch, uh, but she's working in Emory, uh, Emory University in Atlanta as a professor of epidemiology. Uh, but we hear about her in the Netherlands in two ways. Uh, she's writing a column in the NRC, um, and also she's very active on Twitter, uh, on the corner of Twitter I like, the constructive corner and the corner where people really interested and dedicated in, in research are voicing their opinions. Um, so it's great to have you here. 
um, Cecile, we asked you to talk about the field lab experiments. You, you had some strong opinions, uh, like I had myself, I should say, on that. Uh, and maybe you will also show some light on how that was um, in comparison to other ways to fund research. Uh, Cecile, please, please go ahead. We lost your voice. Yeah, the presentation is moving, but, but I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. I was just telling that I'm calling in from Brabant, where it is um, cloudy, cloudy, beautiful Dutch weather. And I'm very happy to be here and also very happy to um, give a short insight in the field lab um, um, experiment. So I was, I was being asked to to share um, what went wrong um, with, with these, uh, these experiments. I do totally share all the optimism, optimistic views um, by Marcel Levy about the quality of research. There is a lot of good research, um, but at the same time, I also think under pressure of COVID, but also in general, I'm not sure that um, COVID um, you know, turns some of our research into something worse that we are normally doing. I think it highlights also the shortcomings in the quality of research um, that, that we are doing. So I'm going to, to share a bit about, uh, I would like to show in this, in this short presentation, the essence of what I think went wrong with the field lab experiments. So what the field lab um, experiments aimed is, um, according to their report, is that they um, wanted to know whether and how we can organize large scale events um, that have a rate of infection that is not higher than we have at home. So at home is our baseline. And if we want to go out of the door and uh, we want to go to places where the risk is at least not higher. And so what these uh, field lab experiments wanted to do is basically, so you cannot um, organize all kinds of events and then just, just see how, how things fare. We don't have the time for it. We wanted to reopen the country uh, fast. So we um, wanted to set up, they want to set up a, a research that is based on, on modeling. So they wanted to know what is the predicted rate of COVID infections at different events that people uh, may be interested in. And so the list of events in the first place, um, uh, it was four different types of events and they added two others. Basically, um, these events uh, that you see here, they differ in how people move um, and when they are together. So the indoor passive events is where people just sit and, and listen. Um, then they have indoor active events like concert and dance where people are cheering, singing, dancing. And then we have the outdoor events uh, where, again, where people are sitting, enjoying a soccer game, or when they are partying at a festival. And then later they added two other events. So for these types of events, so that's the, that's the advantage. So this was basically a modeling study, a prediction study. If, and the, the advantage of that is that you do not need to organize everything in, in uh, all the time to know what the infection rate will be. You take types of events that are really stereotypic for what for a class of events that you want to know the infection rate for. And that is what, what they did. And so what is my background into a prediction? So I um, am, um, am studying already a prediction uh, for my entire career, mostly focusing on how predictive is our DNA. And there we have the same question, not knowing exactly what DNA markers are known for a certain disease, can we, can we predict how predictive genetic tests will be? So for um, diseases like Huntington or cardiovascular disease, can we predict uh, who has a high risk of obesity, high risk of diabetes? And so what we did in, in our research is finding out what predicts the predictive abilities and what makes a test very predictive. And then for genetic diseases, just if you're interested in this, how complex a disease is and how genetic a disease is. If a disease is very, very genetic and very simple because it's only, only one genetic mutation, then we can make genetic tests that can very accurately predict diseases. But if it's not genetic enough or it is too complex, then we cannot model it and not predict very well. And that is also the relationship with this topic. So in general, the quality of predictions, it doesn't matter what kind of predictions, it's determined by two main factors. It's the quality of the data and the quality of the model that determines how accurately we can predict diseases or events or infection rates or disasters, anything. And so for DNA, what there is happening all the time um, is that people think that we can do genetic testing so accurately because they focus too much on how accurately we can um, uh, um, 
assess someone's one's DNA. So the DNA testing goes very accurately, but the problem with, with prediction is that we cannot measure very accurately all the other factors that are relevant, our uh, behavior and our environment, all the other factors that also um, increase a risk of disease. So that is on the data side. So if you can't really get accurate data, the prediction becomes very difficult. But also at the same time, when diseases are very, very complex, we cannot model exactly what makes someone ill. And if we cannot model it exactly, then the prediction also becomes hard. And that is also how I approached initially in the, you know, the work of the field lab experiments. Um, and that is what I will um, share with you in the rest of my short presentation. So the quality of the predictions that the field lab experiment made in their study is determined by the quality of the data that they had available and the quality of their model. And this is the information that I got from their final report. So the data that they used to predict infection rate is a variety of parameters. Uh, some have to do about the behavior of the people who um, attend the events. Some have to do with the environment. So for example, the air quality, is it indoor, is it outdoor? Um, is there a scenario where people can quickly be tested at the entrance? We cannot do that all the time. If you invite thousands of people, that will really uh, cause long delays, but also can you prevent people from attending, uh, infected people from attending the con uh, a conference or a meeting? And also individual behavioral measures, are people wearing a mask? Is there sufficient um, opportunity to wash and disinfect their hands when they go to the restroom, for example? All these parameters go into a model um, to predict whether what the rate of infections um, will be. So what they did for part of that data collection is they organized events. Uh, they organized uh, um, a conference, a theater performance. And then in, that, uh, um, in those um, in events, they split the audience in what they call bubbles that had each had their own um, um, COVID rules. So in some bubbles, people were allowed to choose their own seats when they go to a soccer game. And in other bubble, they were assigned a seat. And then you can, uh, if, you, if you then, um, measure, for example, the number uh, um, and duration of the context, so they were having little monitors on their wrists, the, um, you, can, you can see, is it really, are we reducing the number of personal contacts that people have when they are assigned a seat compared to when they not assigned a seat? And then with those measurements, you can enter that in your model and then try to predict the infection rate. So that is what, what they did. So part of the information they had available uh, about the air quality, about the, how, the, how the environment, uh, how the, um, whether it was indoor or outdoor, but part of it came from behavioral measures during the organized events. The other part of it, so that is the data part. Um, uh, the other part of it was um, the model. And so here is the, uh, the report, very, very unclear. And I understand that this is a, uh, a report just for general audiences and that they don't do all the statistical details. But here's basically what we see in this scheme here, unfortunately it's in Dutch, that they have all kind of information that goes into the model here on the, on the left. And then here where the question mark is, you could put the question mark also a little lower because how they predict the rate of infection for, an, for a single individual in, in, in an hour is, is unknown. So it is not, so it is very unclear what kind of model they made, what kind of choices they made, assumptions they made, limitations they, uh, that such a modeling has. It is very difficult for, for scientists to, um, to know how they uh, predicted that information. And so um, I do not know exactly how they did it, but there are two things that I do know, and that is my, uh, oh, there are two things that I do know. First of all, that the results, the predicted results, uh, look like tables like this, where they had the risk of infection per hour, the chance of for, uh, the risk for uh, hospitalization and death, and they all were very, very small risks. That's good news. And definitely when you are an event organizer, but the question for a scientist, of course, is are these, um, predicted risks, are they accurate? Um, and that totally depends on what is the quality of the data and the quality of the model. So it is nice that these numbers are so low, but when they are low because you model them this way or because you the, the data quality um, um, influences these numbers to be low, then you may expect that when you organize the event later in practice, that the numbers will be higher and that the event will not be as safe as you predicted initially. And so, yeah, these numbers are very low. If you are from the event industry, you like it. But as a scientist, I would like to know, is this true? And this is my two big problems with it. This is my last slide also. Just I want to give you an insight in what is 
what is it was really problematic here. First of all, the data, the data quality, most of it was collected during the field lab events. And so these participants who were at those test events, they know that they were participating in test event to reopen the country. So it is very likely that compared to real events later on, that they follow the regulations more strictly. And so that all these behavioral characteristics were um, uh, more optimal than they what they will be when we organize the events later on. So it is too optimistic scenario. The second time, so, so the second problem is that I do not even know exactly what they did to the modeling, how the model was, uh, was constructed and how it was validated. They did some validation, but the biggest problem is they could not val validation of the model means, is my model correct? Can it really predict uh, under circumstances that I know, can it really predict, um, in this case, infection rates? And here we don't know because they um, did not assess after each event who got infected and who didn't. So the after, after the event testing was voluntarily, and even though approximately 80% of the people at some events um, uh, shared the test result later on, then infections are so rare, 80% is just not enough. So we do not know exactly um, uh, whether the model could predict those infections correctly. So they should have done, done and um, uh, require testing afterwards, see how many people got the events, and then see whether those numbers can be accurately predicted. And so we don't know that. We know that they didn't do that. So we know that they didn't validate the model. We, we do not know, therefore, whether the models predict the infections accurately. And then you end up with this simple situation. If you have poor data, because it's too ideal, it is because people know that they are uh, participating in test events. And you have a poor model because you didn't validate it against the real infections that occurred during those events. You are guaranteed to have poor predictions. And I think that is a really, really insufficient base for um, for policy, so I'm really very glad that the OMT and the and the cabinet um, every now and then just change their their minds, you know, and not exactly follow the recommendations of the field work. Well, well thank you. thank you very much, uh, Cecile. Um, it, it was a very clarifying lecture, um, critical, constructive, um, but but first and foremost clear. Um, you might wonder. Um, could this have been a better study? What 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 did we miss? Uh, what, what, was it prepared well under the time pressure? Could it have been done better? And what can we learn from that in the future? What is your view on that? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think some things we could have done better. It is. I think it is very hard to blind the participants uh, against participating in a test event. But you can always blind them a little bit to what is the purpose of an event. So I think there we could have done something that, 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 that the people who are there do not know exactly, they know that they are going to a test event, but they do not know exactly what's being measured or what they need to do. Uh, that's one thing, but most, most of it, I think that's my other problem. I think, you know, require testing afterwards, knowing how many, what the infections are, and then being able to test whether that was accurately predicted. I think that was the least that they, should, they could have done. Yeah. And I think we should pay attention to those kind of details. You know, it is a, it, this study has so many nice qualities, and I strongly believe in modeling research. But you, that is the weakest aspect of a study that determines its quality. Yeah. And, so and, and what about time pressure, Cecile? Is, is, is that the explanation, or, or is that just an excuse that, that leads to avoidable quality loss? Well, in my life, time pressure is never an excuse for something. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is also, I think, you know, when you have time pressure, then you also need to, and you uh, need to just very, very um, aware of what expertise are you lacking. And I also think that uh, in the conversations, uh, the sparse conversations that I have with researchers uh, on this, I think it is also, yeah, I understand that if you get criticism, you start to defend yourself, but I think more openness, uh, you know, uh, like if I make a mistake, listen and try to do better. Um, these events were not all six organized at the same time. They could have made changes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's feasible. And 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 and, and maybe my my own thought is um, we did rapid peer review on on an informal plane. Uh, but but am I right in say when I say that not that much? Um, data uh, information on the study protocol was available uh, at the time that it, it could have helped. 
I, I totally agree. I never used the word peer review as an argument for that because you know peer review has so many flaws, but I think here there were, especially on the informal peer review platform called Twitter, there were a lot of methodologists in the Netherlands um, making, making persistent calls, share us the information. We would like to help you review. And, and, and I think that should have been disclosed much, much earlier. Okay. And, and I think that is, that is, that is one of, I, I am a strong believer in, in science and the scientific process, but I think here in open critique is something we can really improve. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Seal, for your excellent contribution. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a slave driver this morning. Uh, we need to keep time, uh, more or less. Um, and I'd like to move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Ineke Sluiter. Um, she is the current uh, president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, and she said many things, and she will say some things about it uh, today again about what it did to researchers to get all these insults and even threats uh, during the pandemic. Um, it was a phenomenon that was existing already, but it might have become worse during the pandemic. It draws some attention. Uh, and, and as the president of the KNW, um, Ineke formulated an opinion about it. And, and Ineke, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, you, you joined a little bit later and you're leaving a bit early. It's, it's, all, it's such a busy life uh, being a president, uh, but it's great to have you here. Um, and without further ado, I give you the floor. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Lex. And it's my pleasure to be here. And I apologize for entering late and leaving early. That's all very bad form. But uh, like Lex said, it's the end of term and a lot of things are happening at the same time. So first of all, when I heard the title of this symposium, Academics on Fire, I realized straight away that there is a positive and a negative way of interpreting that. And uh, just character-wise, I'd be uh, inclined to take the positive view. So the pandemic has provided uh, so many opportunities for science. It was, there was excitement connected to the corona year in spite of all the sadness and sickness and the problems that were also visible. But I will um, ascend to the role assigned to me today and be the firefighter this time because there is also a downside. And the downside has to do, I think, with stress. There's a, a stressed out society. The academic system was under stress anyway. And when the two uh, get thrown together, some explosive stuff happens. So what I've noticed is that in these two years now, scholars and scientists have regularly taken responsibility to enrich the societal debate, to inform it with their knowledge and their expertise. And this is in fact part of our third mission. We want our, our scholars, our academics out there we encourage them, we push them into the outside world even a little bit to share the knowledge that we gain in universities with the general audience, only to find that it is rather chilly out there. And so we have all, of, we have all uh, followed how Twitter has actually deteriorated. It is a very toxic uh, environment and so what we have noticed is that the number of threats, there is no systematic research into this yet, but even just judging by the numbers of incidents report, uh, reported, um, it's, it's been a bad time for academics who ventured outside. Now, Twitter itself realized that something was going wrong. And I'm taking Twitter as an example but other social media are also to blame. And Twitter itself therefore stimulated a research project by Rebecca Trombol and Michael Meffert, where they were interested in finding out what are the characteristics of derailing conversations? When is it going wrong? And their team has looked at four points in particular. Is there, uh, can we detect silos? Like, these little focused bubbles where you, know, you get an echo chamber of ideas and it increases the level of noise, so to speak. 
Is there still diversity of perspectives, which is in itself a sign of a healthy conversation? What is the level of incivility and the fourth point of intolerance? And I am particularly interested in those last two now. And in particular, incivility is an interesting category because while incivility violates a norm, a norm of politeness, it can actually be very useful. And this is what is also uh, found by Trumbull and Meffert. It can be very useful in public debate, in political debate, for instance, because the voice of minorities or underrepresented groups tends to need to reach a, a signaling threshold. Otherwise, it simply will not be heard. And in some cases, incivility helps. So that is not necessarily a problem. And in fact, if you look uh, at legislation about free speech, that always and explicitly includes the right to express offensive, shocking, or disturbing points of view. So that's not the problem. Intolerance is a different matter because it tends to shut up people, to break off conversations and dialogue. And in that sense, that it poses a threat to an open society precisely because it will not allow certain groups to even be heard. So for intolerance, we can think of hate speech, racism, misogyny, xenophobia, and other discriminating uh, practices. So that's where they draw the line. Um, academics who venture out on TV or on radio get exposed on Twitter to aggression, threats, intimidation, the use of personal information, doxing, uh, publishing, for instance, where someone lives so that people can go have a coffee with them. These are all definitely intimidating practices. This is not only true for academics. I have also looked at research, especially conducted in the United States. So the situations are not completely comparable, but also in the UK for journalists and politicians, for instance. Um, but academics too are subject to these practices. And this is particularly true whenever academics express themselves on sensitive issues, which tend to be issues of importance to society because they have to do not just with the pandemic, that certainly, but also issues like migration, our colonial past, uh, identity questions. So uh, scholars from the social sciences and the humanities are also at risk here. What I found very shocking in the research, and uh, actually it is one of the reasons why I started bringing this to, um, to the attention um, is that while Twitter is an equal opportunity filth dispenser, it does tend to do so differently for women and people of color than for, uh, let's say, people belonging to other majorities. Uh, and again, this is true for politics, journalism, and science there is a kind of regression to overt stereotyping. And for women, that means that there is a significantly higher proportion of remarks that are about their looks or that contain hostile, sexist, and sexual comments and threats. Let me just sidestep for a second. All of this also has to do with representation, the visibility of women and people of color in public debate and on the social media. So if I take Wikipedia as an example, there are so many fewer, only 17, 17% of the biographies on, on um, Wikipedia are of women. So the visibility is lower. And let me give as an example, Donna Strickland. Donna Strickland is the Nobel Prize winner in physics of 2018, she had no Wikipedia page. Not that none had been offered, there was one. It had been rejected because she had had insufficient media exposure. So this is like a self-perpetuating thing. But once she had, uh, she was awarded the prize, oh, I need to add something. 
At that time, she hadn't even been promoted to full professor. She was an associate professor at age 59 who uh, won the Nobel Prize. And only after she had won that prize did she get her promotion to full professor and a Wikipedia page. So that's a rather unusually high bar to clear, I would say. Okay, so representation is also an issue and this is just one example. Back to aggression on the social media. Well, we may wonder why is this bad? Well, obviously it is bad for the scholars involved personally because it really invades their personal sense of social safety. And this was definitely made worse by the pandemic. When we were all working from home, we were lacking the normal social support system. That is our group of colleagues, our teams at the university where you can easily share some of this stuff. It was probably also the pandemic that made the Twitter onslaught worse because um, people were sitting at home with their telephones and just tweeting off all the, the aggression that they apparently felt. So, so none of this helped. So why is it bad? First of all, the sense of personal social safety of the academics. Then there is also a potential chilling effect. And in fact, uh, since I first brought this to attention in February of uh, the last year, I heard my colleagues say that this was the case, that there is self-censorship. And again, this may have worked differentially for women and people of color. If they withdraw um, disproportionately from uh, the media, from TV, then again, uh, we impact negatively the level and quality of personal, of uh, social debate. So this is bad. Another thing is the way this is happening because online women are being robbed of all the qualifications, the characteristics, their acquired expertise that legitimize their presence on those talk shows in the first place. And they are reduced to simply being women, sexual objects. It's an extremely offensive situation. And as I said, in all of this, public discourse is impoverished. So the public good is harmed. I've always found it important that uh, academics show courage, but I don't see why they should need more courage than an average citizen to just express their views, extremely well-informed views many times. Okay, since uh, this was brought up in February, measures have been taken. The universities of the Netherlands have issued guidelines, but the appeal has been uh, heard, I think, relatively widely, that the first thing we can, to do, we can do is support our colleagues when something like this happens. This means the colleagues need to tell someone that it happens. They need to feel confident to do that and then Deans and rectors need to be there for them and also the group of colleagues. So it's not the moment for ironic and disparaging remarks like, well, you know, why are you on TV all the time? Bad timing and inappropriate. We need to support these colleagues, even if we disagree with them, even if we really dislike their points of view. We need to support them in this one thing. There are also things that we do not need. One thing is we don't need a politics to be too helpful here. Why is that? If incidents come to the attention of politics, the um, intuitive reaction is let's impose higher fines, let's impose heavier sentences. This is not necessary. Judges work within a range and they will always weigh circumstances, social impact. So they can already do this. They have the range. Normally they sentence at the low end of the range. Also, there is no point in singling out certain groups in society in the judicial system. They can weigh impact on society and they already do. So this is just symbol politics. The other problem about politics is that sometimes they tend to muddy the water by uh, seemingly protecting academic freedom. For instance, by suggesting that these threats, which have to do with exposure 
in the public debate are in fact threats to academic freedom in the academic work, uh, research, publication of views, where it's, it is really a different story. There is a KNAW report from 2018 uh, that states there is no reason to suspect that certain voices are eliminated systematically from our universities. And uh, the newspaper NRC conducted um, a questionnaire and they also did not find evidence that this is the case. The risk when politics does this is that it casts suspicion over academia itself. And in fact, it's even worse because it means that diversity and inclusion are accused as the instigators of an unsafe environment rather than uh, trying to promote precisely the best interests of the groups that now suffer most, the minorities that we were just talking about. So politicians get... protecting academic freedom. I'm done, uh, Lex. Oh, that's, a, that's a dangerous uh, step to take. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ian, again. I apologize for the fact that we gave you such a large topic and only 12 minutes. That's, that's well, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. Uh, but thank you for sharing your views and also your concerns, uh, explaining to us all the articulations you, you see and, and, and showing the roads, uh, how it happens. Uh, and, and that is, many people are, are asking a question, so we could spend another hour most likely on, on the topic, but, but, but can you maybe also say a few things um, in terms of prevention and, and, and solution? Um, for instance, one of the people um, responded, say, well, hey, listen, in Twitter also good things are happening. Uh, bad views are criticized and it can be done harshly, but it, it, it works. So is, is there some hopeful science um, to use Twitter to fight these phenomena you, you have been explaining to us, uh, maybe? Well, the thing is, of course, this is true. There are also good discussions on Twitter, although they tend to deteriorate rather quickly once it becomes uh, controversial. Um, the point is that threats and intimidation hurt someone instantly, and it's very hard to, to help them. So the support, I think, that's what I heard from the people who have suffered from this. The support of their surroundings is crucial to them. To know that they're not allow, uh, alone, that people are watching what's happening, that's very important. And what we can't control is the people on the couch with the the aggressive uh, Twitter thumbs. We can't do much about that. So we need to concentrate on doing what is in our control to do. The other thing is that they need to know how do you um, uh, save your ev the evidence, like the screenshots, is your computer safe? When do you need to go to the police and when not? Who do you need to alert? There are just practical things that we can do and those are in the guidelines of the universities. Yeah. Well, thank you again, again very much, Ineke, for giving yeah. us so much food for thought. Uh, we will try to digest it and, and, and put it in our report as good as we can. And, and then you have a second opportunity to comment, of course. Uh, thank, thank you. you. I'd okay. like to move on to the final speaker of, of, of this block of, of our meeting. That is Gauri Krishna. Gauri is an outbreak epidemiologist, but she's also an PI of the National Survey on Research Integrity. And she was a member of the notorious red team that, that commented on the OMT COVID uh, um, well, recommendations uh, as, as such. Her talk, we asked her to talk about uh, preprints, biomedical preprints that became rather popular during the pandemics. And also to talk about the integrity pitfalls uh, connected to death and how we can solve them. So Gauri, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lex. Um, I will attempt to share my screen. Hopefully everything will go well. Um, try to close that. 
So you should be able to see my screen at this moment. Uh, Excellent, please. yes. Okay, great. So in my short talk today, I'd like to weave uh, sort of a story around uh, three main themes, reflecting on how science uh, in a pandemic, and you've already heard some of these themes reverberate through some of my earlier speakers. Um, but I want to also touch on the increased uptake of preprints, as Lex alluded to, and its possible impact on research quality and some reflections on how to safeguard uh, this research quality um, as we move into the open science era. So just very briefly about myself, as uh, Lex alluded to, um, well, some say timing is everything, being at the right place at the right time, and I was fortunate uh, in my uh, career so far to be uh, twice in the middle of uh, two uh, uh, epidemics with the coronavirus, uh, once as a young epidemiologist in 2002, um, working uh, as an infectious disease epidemiologist with the Singapore Ministry of Health, and then 17 years later uh, in the COVID COVID pandemic, but this time not only as an epidemiologist, but also as a research integrity researcher. What was striking to me as an epidemiologist involved in the SARS epidemic uh, some 17 years ago, a world essentially before open science, preprints, even uh, the extent of the use of social media, was the sheer explosion of scientific papers being published. So what you see here are two graphs, uh, the one on the left and the right, strikingly similar exponential growth, except the one um, on the left is on COVID-19 cases, round about the time of the WHO global alert, and the one on the right on COVID-19 papers published around the same time point. And essentially what we see here is not only an explosion of COVID-19 cases, but also an equivalent of explosion of its publications like never seen before in other outbreaks. And this is something we've already heard from some of our earlier speakers. Now, we know that this speed is partly the result of faster journal publications, um, but really where we saw the surge uh, is in preprints. And this is quite a nice uh, nature analysis, um, a little bit outdated. This is from 2020. What the graph essentially shows you in orange COVID-19 preprints and in gray bars, non-COVID-19 preprints. And what we see is that there has been a surge of up to 500 articles per week, round about uh, towards uh, the peak in Europe um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has somewhat sort of watered down over time, but there still remains uh, a high amount of uh, preprint research being pushed out. Access and coverage of COVID-19 preprints has also been higher than for non-COVID-19 uh, preprints. Now, this is not surprising uh, to us. Uh, COVID-19 preprints are shared uh, more than 90% of the time compared to non-COVID-19 uh, preprints. We know this from some recent studies. Up to 65% of preprints are cited in international policy documents, such as the ECDC, WHO, and even UK government policy documents. Studies have also shown that the views of COVID-19 preprints are much higher, up to 20 times higher than non-COVID-19 preprints. So as I mentioned, all of this is not surprising, but it does go to show that preprints are playing an important role in COVID-19 policies, but also information accessed by different types of users. So the question arises if the speed and the extent at which we are sharing and using COVID-19 preprints is helping or hurting research quality and integrity. And this is a question I've been busy with um, in the last year or so. Uh, and as with many things, there are several sides to a coin, I would say not only two. Uh, in the interest of time, I will present you only two sides. So on the one hand, we see that early sharing of research findings can, and it has led to flawed public policy and misinformation with public health consequences. Some of the more prominent examples you may recognize on the slide, uh, the anti-malaria drug based on a very small flawed study uh, by the man pictured here, um, led to US politicians hailing it as a miracle cure. Uh, and as a result, a massive diversion of supplies of the drug from lupus patients for which it was indicated to COVID-19 patients. A little bit more recently, uh, the ivermectin story, again on a preprint findings, which led to uh, cases of near fatalities and, some, and in some cases fatalities as well. 
But that, of course, is not to say that journal publications and journal peer review is the holy grail. I think we all are aware that there have been phenomenal retractions in prestigious journals, too, in this pandemic. Now, the other side of the coin is not to say that all early research finding has been detrimental. So there have been positive sharing of preprints in early research. I'm just going to, I'm having an interruption here, one second. It's gonna close that. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, Gauri, but uh, you have difficulty in going uh, forward. Yes, I have some difficulty here. Just one second, please. Yes, I'm back. Sorry about that. I had a, uh, a strange interruption. So as I was saying, the uh, not all uh, sharing of early research has been detrimental. We have also had had positive examples of early research findings. We heard uh, uh, a little bit earlier from Marcel Levy that a bulk of early research findings have been coming from clinical observations and case studies. And there has been positive sharing in the management of COVID-19 patients as a result of this early sharing of such kind of data, while they might not be the optimal uh, kind of data uh, that we need for other kinds of policy decisions. There has been sharing to a certain extent of codes and specifications for creating contact tracing um, uh, initiatives. However, there seems to be a need for an important distinction between the types of early research findings. So research on treatments and interventions, even on serology and model predictions may potentially have more harmful consequences when methodologically flawed than perhaps other kinds of research. Our recent findings from the National Survey on Research Integrity, which is currently one of the world's largest and unique studies on research integrity out of about 7,000 academics in the Netherlands, uh, we estimated up to one in two um, frequently admitting to committing questionable research practices. That's nearly slightly higher than 50%. And about one in 12 uh, estimated to uh, committing research misconduct. And these are findings uh, reporting on research such as behaviors in the last three years, so from late 2020 to 2017. So not necessarily reflective of the current pandemic, but non-pandemic times. So the picture for research quality is clearly in need of improvement, which raises the question, if the early sharing of research might just be transferring the problem of sloppy research, in some instances, perhaps fraudulent research to the public domain. And this is a question, as I mentioned, I have been busy with. Um, so where do we actually go from here? A few reflections I would like to expand on on a recent nature review I have been addressing. So firstly, as we embrace open science, such as preprints, we must also recognize that scholarly critique will occur more and more in the open. It is paramount for safeguarding early research findings, especially when they have the potential for high impact on policy. And we have seen some phenomenal open critique already in this pandemic, sometimes much more rigorous than peer review, I have to say. Um, and so we have to start embracing open scholarly critique. Now, having said that, we must also recognize that as we embrace open scholarly critique and open science, then we also need to encourage open and transparent declarations of conflicts of interest. We as scientists are starting to directly interact with different types of stakeholders, especially in a pandemic such as this, policymakers, journalists, to the public. This open scholarly critique must also be respectful. Researchers and research institutions need to recognize the need to protect against harassment and bullying, a point that you just recently heard from Inika. Preprint servers and research integrity responsibility. This is also an area I think that deserves some attention. Most preprint servers at the moment are currently vetting the research that is posted, but this vetting is superficial at best. It vets against outrageous claims or conspiracy theories. So this really begs the question of, is there a need for certain kinds of reporting standards as we do have uh, for authors in journals? Um, what kind of retraction policies are there for preprint servers against sloppy, even fraudulent preprints? 
Finally, I'd like to say that we should adopt a red team approach. Um, as Lex alluded to, I've had the privilege, in my opinion, of being part uh, of, uh, of the red team in the last year or so. Um, however, I believe that a red team approach should be opening up research to critique at every stage of its production cycle and not necessarily at the stage of publication. So some of us in this circle already know that there are a few concrete initiatives that exist, registered reports uh, being one of them, where peer review of the methods of a study are encouraged and conducted before the study is conducted and data is collected. And more preprint specific, there are also several initiatives. Uh, review Commons uh, is one example where work can be requested to be reviewed as a preprint before it is posted. The Wellcome Trust has also um, set out an outbreak signs rapid pre review and specific actually to uh, reviewing preprints before they are published. And then finally, onto my last slide to leave you with um, my own thoughts that as we move towards preprints and research becoming more accessible to the public, research integrity, I believe, should be a collective responsibility of all stakeholders of research. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gauri, for sharing your views um, on, 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 on this topic. I especially liked the historical dimension by comparing what happens during the SARS pandemic and the COVID pandemic. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, what interests me as well is wh what can we do to, to improve the quality of, of pre-submission, uh, commenting, uh, post-publication, peer review. Uh, you said already we should reward these activities because they take time. But how can we nudge people in becoming more constructive and more helpful in, in these commenting modes? Do you have any ideas on that as well? I think there's a, a long list of skills that researchers uh, need, uh, not just actually really doing their research well, but also being able to write excellent funding proposals, being able to connect and network in order to be able to go further in their research. And uh, many instances also being able to uh, be great at graphics. And, uh, and now we have, you know, we just keep adding a growing list. So I do think that science communication is something that is important. Is it something that researchers themselves need to be skilled in, perhaps? But I also do think that research institutions um, should put in place initiatives that might be uh, um, uh, to support researchers to not only develop those skills, but also to be able to put in place communications um, officers who can support them uh, as we actually start to embark into closer contact with different kinds of stakeholders. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really important. Um, thank you so much. Uh, for the sake of time, Gauri, I'd like to thank you again for your excellent contribution and also the other speakers. But now I hand over for the plenary discussion to my uh, colleague chair, Kalein Bouten. Kalein, the floor is yours uh, and I will shut up. Thank you, Lex, and thank you, speakers, for your excellent contributions. I would like to ask the people uh, from Kalaway and my, my colleague, uh, committee members to uh, also share their, open their camera and uh, so they can join us in this um, discussion. What we're going to do now is um, we have a focused discussion on, on the topic we discussed or in, and heard about today. And uh, we will start that with three questions from the audience. Uh, and we start with one exercise question that uh, Yolanda from Kanabe will help us with. Welcome all on the screen. Um, you have seen that you can put your questions in the Q&A. Well, you can only see the questions as a public if the question is answered. But be sure that we keep all your questions, you keep, we keep all your answers. We also keep everything that you want to share with us in the chat. Yeah, we use it in our reports. We cannot come on to all of it today. Now, I would like to ask uh, Yolanda to, uh, to share the first question, which is just a practice question to see if this works in uh, under pressure and in times of COVID. You may see a, a, a question on your poll, which is just to practice. Are you watching this webinar from the Netherlands? You can sing, simply answer yes or no. And we will probably get an answer from Yolanda as well, visible on the screen. 
and we cannot vote as panelists. Yolanda, can you, can you give us the answer? Otherwise, I'll give you the lose. answer. I have 94% from out of the Netherlands and 6% from out of another okay. country. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we cannot see the answers on our screen. Maybe, you Maybe can... if I end it, you can see it. I, I will end this one. Shared results, sorry. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, okay. So we would like to, to have some information from you. Uh, having three statements, and the first statement will be shared with us now. Scientists did a great job communicating the results of COVID research to the decision makers and the public science. You can indicate if you agree, agree with that, somewhat, somewhat disagree or completely disagree. And of course, you may have an opinion here. We also phrased the question a little bit opinionated. But give your opinion in the chat, please. Yolanda, can you share with us the results of this? Yes. Yeah, very scientific answer. We somewhat agree. <laughs> so there is room for discussion. Let's move to the second question. This was about our own contribution to science and communication. Decision makers like government or parliament used evidence from the COVID research poorly and very selectively. Again, this is a little bit phrased opinionated. Do you agree? You somewhat agree? You somewhat disagree or completely disagree? Can you show the answer, Shalanda? There's some polarization here but no one completely disagrees. Thank you, Yolanda. Can you show the last slide? The enormous time pressure on COVID research led to unacceptable quality compromises. You agree, you somewhat agree, you somewhat disagree or completely disagree. So the enormous time pressure on COVID research led to unacceptable quality compromises. And of course, your opinion may have been changed by the lectures today. And this is also good for us to know. Yeah, you have information now. Can you show the answers, Yolanda? This is interesting. We would like to hear in the chat, or perhaps you have a, a, a question that we can see in the Q&A, how you feel about this. Yeah, so the pressure on, on research. Good, thank you so much. Now it is our challenge in the panel to, to have a discussion about it. And I would like to first ask Cecile to, to perhaps reflect on, the, on the, the response she got from the audience. Was this unexpected or? I would like to ask Cecile, did you hear the answers from the from the audience? And you need to unmute your mic, otherwise I will ask your colleagues. <laughs> Not working. This is terrible. Gauri, can you um, can you reflect on the on the the audience response you got for the uh, well, how we use as scientists, our information to inform politicians and the speed that is accompanied with that. Sorry, Cecile. She's unmuted at the moment, but I guess we can't. We, we still can't hear her. I, I have to say that I'm, actually, I'm, I'm quite interested to hear from the audience on the last question, which was clearly on my talk on research quality during the pandemic. It's interesting to see that the opinions are divided there, nearly a 50% agreeing with the statement and 50% disagreeing with the statement. I think indeed, as I tried to present, there are really two sides to the coin. And, and overall, I do believe that scientists have performed very well under the time pressure. We must understand that this is a new and emerging disease. 
uh, we are constantly needing to reinvent and understand our and expand our knowledge uh, and evidence base. So I think given the time pressure we have uh, done the best that we can. However, I think that the, the, the question of research quality is something that goes beyond uh, just the research quality during the COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly the speed has, you know, perhaps not helped. And when you look at um, uh, how quickly we have responded with, re with regards to treatment, with regards to vaccines, I think we've done tremendously well. However, there is also a large amount of wastage of research. Uh, as a result of this, there is a large amount of uh, sloppy research already in non-COVID pandemic times. So this really begs the question of what is really the larger research quality of all of the COVID-19 research that has come out. And I think this is really where we need a uh, better understanding of the data. Um, so it would be really interesting indeed to hear from the ones that have disagreed with this statement, what their points of view are. But I do believe that the COVID-19 pandemic is a stress test, looking really at the system of science and how research is done. And therein lies answers to improving research quality broadly, not only specific to this pandemic. Okay, so there was a, a remark in the Q&A uh, of a, uh, uh, someone from the audience say, stating, should we have a different peer review system in terms of speech? Should we have a, a very fast peer review system or even perhaps journals that, more journals that do this to, uh, to reflect on this? I think most of the very urgent papers were rapidly reviewed, but what is your opinion on that? I mean, I'm, I'm also looking at the others in the audience here. Um, we, we do know that journal peer review time has shortened tremendously uh, for COVID-19 research. It has halved uh, compared to actually non-COVID research. We know this uh, from recent studies. Uh, I think So I think within that light and the time pressure that we have, I do think that all stakeholders, including journals and editors have done their best. There's certainly an always room for improvement peer review as a whole. Uh, how we perform peer review as a whole, I think needs uh, uh, definitely, it's, uh, it requires uh, uh, improvement. Uh, at the moment, uh, we don't recognize and reward peer review concretely. And I think really that is where we should put the carrot. We're rewarding uh, publications and quantity of publications. It's slowly changing towards quality of publications, but I do really think that the cornerstone of good research lies in organized skepticism. It is about that critical dialogue between researchers and essentially that is peer review. So we need to actually bring that more to the forefront, not only in a crisis, but we need to actually bring that more in the forefront in the rewarding and recognizing of research. Yeah, um, so that, that, that's true for the whole field, of course. Cecile, how is your mic microphone? You're now muted on my screen. It's not working, right? It's a real pity. Perhaps it has got something to do with your volume, Cecile. Do you know? Perhaps someone from Canada can help you. I'm not sure. So I, I was uh, actually, uh, we, we spoke a lot about it, the speed of the, the medical research and uh, the, especially our first speaker indicated how, how fast everything went from two weeks uh, until uh, the, the first paper came out. That is more difficult if we do um, behavioral science, like in the field labs, and, and still the audience or the public wants very fast results. So I would like to ask perhaps also Cyrus on the screen or the other people, how to deal with speed in non-medical science in under COVID times. Is that possible, what the audience wants? We want our answers tomorrow. Maybe Cecilia, you can chat about it. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, I'm really- You can. Here. Yeah. I have no clue what happens. Magic. Some, yeah, magic, magic here. Um, so how to speed up? Um, uh, I think, you know, we can always speed up by making the initial quality of studies better. Um, and I, 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 so, so that is where I put, uh, if I had to put my money somewhere, is to get more rigorous, but that's, that's for the long-term solution, eh? not for the very short term, but more rigorous training in methods and statistics. I think too, so I, I never understand why researchers take a, a shortcut that invalidates the research when it takes the same time to do better. And I think it is, in many cases, it is just because we don't rigorously train researchers in understanding methods and statistics rigorously enough, you know, to make, to make informed choices. You know, most researchers are an expert 
in medicine or in psychology, or they all have their content topics, and then they learn methods and statistics on the side, but not good enough, uh, is my view, to really make informed choices on, on what, what to do for the most um, uh, reliable and valid research. So I think when, uh, so when the initial research is good, then failure of peer review is less of a problem. But we need peer review, you know, as a kind of a, a kind of a, a, a gate, a gateway to prevent that our poor studies, you know, move on. So, so how do you feel about sharing the, the news like uh, Marcel Levy did by email to inform all his colleagues? Is it that um, our, also our duty as a scientist well, in times would, of crisis? In times of crisis, yeah, if, if you, um, yeah, I, I don't, so I, of course, as, a, as a, when we start all doing that, and it's not, I think it's very difficult for others to evaluate the quality of the science, and that's why we have peer review, because then people say this is, this is peer reviewed, but I think at the same time, what we also said, peer review quality is sometimes so poor, that, you know, it's just three other people read your work, and that um, we can't really rely on that, so do, do I like it that some people share their email of their results already with the people who, who need to use it? Um, I, I, yeah, it depends a little bit on how, who does it and what is the work. It is somewhat like. agree and somewhat disagree in yeah. our book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Difficult. Okay. Very last question. And I know this discussion time is extremely short, and this is better done in in life in, in face to face uh, um, public. Um, I see some big questions in the chat, really big, that, that we will need a whole day to answer these. Um, there was one, one important uh, aspect that came out today, also in the, in the Q&A, that regarding communication about results that have not yet been validated and sharing these uh, on television or even with the uh, policy, uh, our, our government. How do you feel? And I'll ask Gauri first. Um, should we re ask these scientists to refrain from public engagements if they inform the government so they can do it objectively or with less information? Yeah, I think, I think there, there are several, you know, um, threads actually to this question. I mean, clearly in the in in a crisis, you know, speed is of essence. And I think someone in the chat is already actually making reference to that. So the speed should not uh, predate or supersede, you know, the quality of the research. And I think we also need to take into mind that because of the speed, you know, that the quality may inevitably be reduced. Um, so it's really actually a juggling of uh, the speed versus the quality. And one way to come around that, uh, two things I can think of is to openly share limitations of the research. So to be very clear that these findings may be preliminary, to be very clear about what are some other considerations to take into account as you look into this data, I think it's really key. And I think it's really important to also state conflicts of interest very openly, very transparently, if you are on the editorial board, if you are on yeah. the shareholders yeah. board, to really state these conflicts of interest openly. And I think we, we, don't, we do not do that enough. And I cannot underline the fact enough in the three years that I've been doing research on integrity that I think COVID-19 has really been a magnifying glass. It has really been a stress test uh, for all of the cracks that are happening in the system of science. It has really highlighted these issues that we are discussing today, um, you know, about peer review, uh, about um, uh, low quality research happening okay. in non-crisis times. Thanks, so we will definitely Consider this in our report as one of the outcomes, perhaps possible positive outcomes of the COVID pandemic. Um, Cecile, you want yeah. to add one? You have two seconds. Oh, yeah. Two seconds. Then I would like to echo Gauri's point of that we need more open peer, of open critique. You know, we need to. So I hear so much critique on studies behind the doors and people not daring to speak it up. I think we need to become a more. If you are not polite by by from your from yourself, then, then train it. 
<laughs> so uh, we need to have uh, this this normal conversation skills about research and not only promoting you know someone else's work when the quality is is uh, substandard because we are giving the wrong message to junior researchers we need to have and I think you know when the, when people share their work and others are allowed and, and you know it is well received to openly critique openly disagree with things in a constructive way I think we create a much healthier scientific climate that we so desperately need in times of crisis. Okay, and now we need to also consider the, the cautious words of Ineke, that we should not have more courage than the others to do that, but we still mm -hmm. need a little bit of courage, so if I hear you. Yeah, we need it. Yeah, yeah. We Thank you very much. I would like to, uh, to thank the speakers, also the speakers uh, that are not available anymore. Uh, they had to leave early. Um, I would like to shortly give the word to Natalie. Just, just to thank um, all the um, uh, speakers sincerely for, for, for sharing your reflections with us, which will greatly help us in uh, finalizing this report. And also thanks to Lex and Kalein for the excellent moderation. Thank you. Also, thank you to the audience for your active involvement, some of you. And I would like to refer you to our last um, uh, expert meeting, which will take place in January, January 18th. And of course, you can again, uh, yeah, join that meeting and let Kanabe know you will do that. And I think Eva is already typing in something on the chat regarding the agenda. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, panelists. Have a good day. Bye bye.